Oh, wait, now we get to chirp him. Mm -hmm. At least it wasn't me being late this time. Mm -hmm. Where are we at? You're on there. Sorry. It's live here. I'm going to share it. We're live. Hello, everybody. I know. Coach Mitch is popular. Everyone's freaking out. Everyone wants to know where Coach Mitch is. Oh, yeah. And uh, we are waiting for him. He's having some technical difficulties this morning. And uh, he should be with us in just a moment. Um, we are sharing, so feel free. Can you guys hear us okay? If you can hear us fine, because we are using... We're kind of through Facebook Live, but we're through our usual video conference software for y'all today. Um, so make sure you give us a like or comment below so that we know that you can hear us okay. Oh, yeah. Live with Sorry. Coach Mitch. And I put hopefully. <laughs> Coming on right on. Public done. Yes. All righty. Yep. We can hear you. Awesome. What's up, Dan? And Danielle, mm. howdy, Pia. Dave, what's up? What's up? I saw. Dave, yeah, I saw you sent a uh, text. I saw it come through. Ah, there he is. Now, how do I Yay. get? It? Can I leave? Can we? Um... Yeah, this one can. Uh, I can move this one. Remove. Where is it? Oh, remove right under. Two more. There you go. There you go. There nice. we go. Yay! You're live on Facebook, buddy. Hey, finally. Is this your first time you've ever been live on Facebook? Um, by my own accord, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's some exciting stuff, hey, buddy? Make sure you go back to the yeah. so I can uh, Sorry to go back. All right, guys, we're just sitting in this bar. Yeah. I think so. Okay, so here, can you leave, then you guys chat and I will yeah, no, take care on. of this. Just make sure, like, so you the, what do you need, this page? Oh, right, You're good, just make it low and hand it to me. Okay. I'm gonna be producing there again today. Sweet. Coach, what's up? What's up? Hi, everybody. What up, uh, dude, You got all kinds of fans up there, man. I know it. People are going nuts. I hope. Uh, I think I, I, uh, Sasha's on. Yep. I haven't seen Sasha in years. <laughs> Robert. Liquor. Christy. Richard, good. You found it. Mike, awesome. Rob. Christy, thank welcome you. Welcome, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thank you. I know it's so weird of like having to go through here because it's like uh, typically Mitch, we can see it at the bottom of like comments. Yeah, so, so I have like to manage strange. it from here, but we're good. Okay. Why do I still hear your phone? Coach, how are we doing today, buddy? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you and how's everybody? We are doing phenomenal. Phenomenal. Man. It's the best time of the year. <laughs> it's tryout season. One of my favorites. Yeah, exactly. Everybody's favorites. <laughs> so how's trials been going so far for oh, you? Oh, Sasha says you're big news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, I, I know. I made I made social media. Huge, <laughs> all over buddy we're gonna break the internet uh, exactly. <laughs> i mean every everything's going well here i mean just in general you know you, you, this is a stressful time for parents for for clubs you know trying to figure out where do they play what's best for my kid where is he going to develop the most where is he going to play the most you know well, all this stuff where there. where are we going to win where am i going to go to nationals for some people and you know um, so there, there's a lot of different factors and a lot of, a, a lot of people are in a lot of different places and looking for a lot of different things. So it's, um, you know, it, it's a, it's, it's a complex situation depending on what you're looking for, what level your son or daughter is and where they're at and kind of what you're looking for. Are you in a development stage? Like, you know, the younger ages are, you know, when you're, you know, more with the older kids, the 16s, 18s, and, you know, even going into the 14s and 15s, it's exposure and, you know, my tier one kid or my tier two kid. So there's a lot of different dynamics going on this time of year. And, you know, <clears throat> parents and players are trying to figure it out and as well as the clubs and the coaches. So oh, yeah. it's, uh, it's no putting doubt. it all together. I think what's um, so a big reason for, you know, for our viewers that don't know who coach Mitch is. And so, all right, so go. yes, exactly. <laughs> so coach, tell us a little bit about your background. Like one of the reasons obviously of why, besides the fact that we've known each other since um, pretty much I was in diapers and you were screaming at me at clinics when I was a baby, <laughs> besides that fact. But um, one now of the things, got a gray hair. yeah, exactly. My <laughs> first one, buddy, I got one the other day. It's crazy. That yeah. Was, because of you, I have no hair. So <laughs> <laughs> 
But one of the things of why it was so unique to have you on and why from a perspective standpoint, right? One of the things we're always talking about and trying to educate the community and be able to talk about is that what makes your path so unique is how the fact that you've been a lifer just like me, right? For all these years you've been at it, played high level, tier one, all that stuff coming up at the youth levels, then college and all that. So we've seen all the gamut, but then more importantly now, what makes it so unique that of a perspective that we share that a lot of people maybe locally don't share is the fact that we've been able to watch players from the time they were 10 years old and they were some of the best in the world to watching them progress and seeing what it turned into over a lifespan. So you've gotten to live already through a few lifespans of watching players go from young age to now playing in the NHL and all that stuff. So, you know, it's a, it's an interesting perspective to have been able to see that from a youth perspective, because a lot of times what happens is we know that parents haven't lived it. So they don't understand the life cycle yet. We know that a lot of coaches don't really know the extent of just how good some players are that are out there at a young age. So it's a lot of cool things that we get to kind of unravel and get into today. Um, that really excited me, you know, from being able to have you on here and talk about, cause again, it's the experience is so important of what you're able to share. Um, but, you know, tell us a little bit about also from your, you know, the highlights of what you want out there, obviously of like what your background is and all that stuff, just so people understand and start putting a little context to who you are. Yeah. So, and so some people on this call probably, probably know this um, for those that don't know me is that I'm, I'm, I'm like Vinny. I grew up in basically Philadelphia. Uh, Vinny, Vinny actually played, grew up playing with my younger brother uh, and as well as one of um one of the partners at Legacy and Travis Howe. So uh, they're a little younger, but I've known them. I was a little older than them, but I grew up playing here. Um, I played for the Haverford Hawks till through my first, I think my first year squirt or, or uh, I think it was that I made the jump to AAA or back then there was no AAA, no, right? So like things have changed. <laughs> so, so uh, we were only, we were, we were only double, little flyers were only double A. And back then the little flyers were the only double A, uh, team within two hours of here. Um, obviously, there weren't as many ranks, there weren't as many kids playing, but you were literally getting the best of the best, you know, at least geographically for the most part in that area. Um, so, played a little Flyers, played uh, when I was a little older, Junior Flyers came around, had a junior team, did a little bit of that, then went out to the Saskatchewan League for a little bit, bounced around there, um, and some trials in the USHL, then ended up at Nichols College. And then end up at the um, uh, Nichols College of Massachusetts, and then ended up going to a camp for the, the Detroit Vipers um, for a couple of days, and got sent home packing. It wasn't good enough, so yeah. it was a tough yeah. pill, tough pill to swallow. But also one of the <clears throat> one of the best days of my hockey careers because I made one of the best decisions ever. I actually came back and sold my goalie equipment, and haven't been back in the net since. <laughs> I enjoy skating out in men's league a lot more. Um, for people who don't appreciate goaltending, it's in my opinion, it's by far the hardest position in sports. Um, just with everything is going on from a mental standpoint to the responsibilities of, and everybody only cares. You have one job, keep the puck out of the net. It's not a fair position. It's not for the weak minded. And, um, it's definitely, it, it, I definitely, I'm, I'm glad I was a goalie, uh, growing up and I learned a lot of a lot about hockey and but it also taught me a lot of life skills which we try to at the youth level you you hope the sports um generating those as well um but it was a, definitely a relief uh now i can cherry pick like everybody else um i like playing the wing so i don't have to come back in the defensive zone <laughs> and eventually, so it was a good move for me um so after i got done playing i stepped away from hockey for about a year and a half and then uh, one of our uh, friends passed who just recently passed away uh, was uh, starting a new pro uh, youth program out of the flyer skate zone in Voorhees, New Jersey, where the Philadelphia Flyers practice out of. And he called me up and asked me if I wanted to coach. And the, I was probably 22 at the time or so 23. Um, actually, Travis Howe was working at the skate zone at the same time. Uh, and, and Joe Templin as well was one of the guys that came in and, and uh, another legacy guy was co coaching here, but Jack brought, brought me in, kind of took me under his wing for the first couple of years. Uh, I assisted with him. I learned a lot about coaching. Um, one of the biggest things that I learned is just because you know a, a lot about hockey or you think you know a lot about hockey, uh, 
coaching is is completely different. Um, being able to communicate that to the players and um, you have to have the you have to understand the mindset of the players. But when you're a coach, it's 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 more than just knowing and understanding hockey. Um, it's like anything else, it's like being a you know being a boss or a manager in real life. You have to understand your business, know your business, but you got to know how to manage and uh, all the strategies and different things that go with that. So I've been, I've been here with the Flyers youth for what seems like forever. Um, I, I, we partner with the Virtua um, team. We're called team Virtua. Now I went over there, coached a coach a couple years, but still remained with the Flyers uh, youth and, and some skills capacity and everything else. And now I back here coaching uh, um, vice president of the Flyers youth. And then also, uh, coach Bantam AA. And then from a legacy and select standpoint, I've been coaching um, all of our different types of tournament teams over the years um, from A to AAA to elite. Uh, coach the East Coast select teams for going on like 12 years now and East Coast and West Coast select teams now and been all over the world with them and seen all kinds of great players from Connor McDavid to um, you know, Travis Dermont to Alex Tuck, who kind of came through and wore the legacy uh, logo. And I enjoy, I just enjoy coaching. I enjoy teaching the kids, whether they're top prospects or I'm out at the Flyers youth or any, or a, a, a legacy and SHD clinic with the, with the younger guys and just going over the basics and teaching them and just getting them excited to learn. So mm -hmm. I enjoy teaching and, um, you know, and, and coaching, whether it's, you know, the elite kids at, at, you know, the best tournaments in the world, like WSI, or just out on a, a Tuesday skill session with the mites and watching all the little uh, seven, eight year olds skating around with a smile and trying to toe drag me. So it's, it's great. Awesome. Well, we didn't ask you why you love coaching, so, uh, but sure. Why not share? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, how do you have seven year olds skate better than you do? <laughs> Thank you. They, they 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 haven't they haven't figured out that I added an extension to my stick to, so I don't have to move as much so I just reach so my reach is longer now so I can hook them and bring them back in. I still play a little old school hockey at practice where hooking is allowed for me yeah. and slashing. So I they may be able to skate better, but once I get a stick on them, they're they're done. Oh yeah, you shouldn't be crossing the board against the head, but. <laughs> So, but I, I mean, I, I like coat. I mean, I I love hockey, right? So yeah. I've been in hockey my whole life. It's uh, it's what I, what I, what I, depending who you ask, it's what I feel I know the best, but that could, that could, that, that varies on who you ask. We have um, a lot of experts in our field. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the, the one thing that doesn't change is that I do love it. I'm passionate about it. And, and I, and I, I do it because, you know, the coaching side of it, but I, I, I like giving back, right? I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have coaches that coached me um, and gave their time. I was fortunate. I had really good coaches growing up for the most part. And, um, you know, a lot of them were non-parent coaches or some of them were non-parent coaches that they did it because it was the same thing. And I enjoyed teaching the kids like life lessons, you know, the things that you learn out, I think sports in general. And I kind of talk to my team every year when we have our meetings is, you know, hockey is one side of it, but the life skills that you learn out of, I think sports in general, um, but especially hockey, because it's such a physically, uh, emotionally, a mentally demanding sport and a, such a high intense capacity all the time when you're playing and practicing. It's like no other, it teaches you teamwork, teaches you how to handle adversity. Um, it teaches you how to be a good teammate and be a good person and, um, and work ethic and showing on time, being accountable, being responsible. And all those translate uh, into real life. Like uh, I'll never forget what Gus Del Cole said to me who, Actually, I haven't talked to in years. Is, is he, said hello, the he said hello, by the way. He said, I saw, I saw, I saw that. As he said, you know, Mitch, he goes, at the end of the day, and his son was a probably the best, the best, one of the, if not the best youth player I've ever coached. Oh, I've yeah. coached a lot, a lot of, a bunch of NHL guys. But, it, uh, and obviously he's in the Islander organization, so he's still, you know, a great hockey player. But um, he said, I just want my kid to learn. I don't care if he plays in the NHL, I want him to learn and be able to, take something out of here so he can, you know, earn a living and be a good person. And I, I think those things, whether you walk away from the game at your 20, you're done playing or whatever is, 
you know, those, the life, the hockey's the hockey that doesn't change and you do it because you love the game, but the, the life, the life skills and uh, that you, that you're able to pull out of sports and the hockey in particular, they stick with you for the rest of your life. And, you know, they're great things that you need, whether you're, you know, whether you're a school teacher or you're a business guy, the accountability, the responsibility and um, being, being able to work, work through players. And you're not always going to agree with people. You're not always going to agree with your teammates. Hey, this guy should have passed me the puck. Well, guess you didn't get it. It doesn't mean the game stops. It doesn't mean that you pout and you whine about it and you stop playing. And I don't want to play with this. You, you figure out how to make it work. And it's the same thing in real life. You got to figure out how to make things work because if everything went to plan, uh, no one would have jobs or very few people would have jobs and everything would be perfect. So it's just uh, hockey's like life. You know, it's you got to adapt and, and figure out how to make it work. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think one of the biggest things, right, of that, it's funny. Yesterday we were on a uh, on a podcast, and we can't wait. I think Friday gets enough put out there. But yeah. you know, we had been asked that question of, you know, everyone talks about the life skills component, right? But how do you actually apply it, right, to the game? And I think that's one of the things from an organizational standpoint, right? Is that it'd be interesting, like your perspective of like what's some of the things that you've seen evolve in terms of trying to implement it in, making it a part of the culture challenges or things that have worked like what kind of things have you been able to raise awareness to tell people understand just how important that is because from our take i know of like from what we're going through right the biggest part as you know that the biggest driver for me of what i've loved about you know, we go on to the mindset development piece but ultimately that's really what it is our whole thing anyone we bring through and okay what's our first our philosophy is life skills first sports skills second because of sports skills, that's a piece of cake. It's the life skills part that we really hone in on of why when we look at what we're doing is the importance of understanding the unconscious behavior, understanding who you are, what you need, because that's the driver of when we talk about the life skills. What we love about what we do is players' communication goes up, gets so much better because they're able to clearly identify what they need to do, right? Their ability to understand and uh, the coach's perspective goes up because they realize, wait, okay, I am, a, this isn't just about me. It's about the we, right? So these are things from a life skill component that goes into any job you have, any person you're dealing with, teammate work, you know, somebody at work, all that stuff. So it'd be great to hear your perspective of now that it's becoming more of a mainstream, like we talk about how important it is to implement the life skill. But I'd love to know from your end of like what's some of the stuff that you guys have over the course of the last four or five years evolved and gotten better at of understanding how to make it more of a part and make it more of like, hey, listen, this is a real thing that we can teach, not just say it's life skills. Like we're actually bringing it to the forefront and trying to get after it. What's some of the stuff that you found is working? Well, in the last four or five years, it's it's actually been a lot tougher than it was, you know, the previous 15 years, in my opinion. The, 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 the players, the parents, the dynamics have changed. You know, it's uh, whether you're, you want to call it millennials or, or, or the, that kind of bracket of people that are coming uh that are coming up. It's, it's different than when you and I grew up, you know, and any, anyone who's you know, older is, you know, when we grew up, not me, I'm not you know, our parents, <laughs> yeah, not, not Marissa. Um, so, um, you know, when we grew up, your parents really didn't say anything to your coaches. Your parents told you whatever your coach says you do, you shut up, you work hard and everything else. And your parents kind of took more of a, they let the coaches coach where nowadays it's a, it's a little different. Parents are more, parents are more involved. They spend a lot of money on it. Um, and, and, and there's also a different dynamic, I think, for some of the life skill sets. It's the difference between, hey, are you in a team activity in a team sport like hockey or are you in an individual sport like lacrosse or I'm sorry, like tennis or golf or yeah. something like that? Um, and, you know, for, especially on the teamwork, the teamwork side and trying to figure out and handle things like that, um, that, 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 that becomes a big issue. And, all, and, and I think a big part of where you're, where you, those skills kind of come into play, come into buying in, buying into and, and believing in what you're doing, whether, you know, it's the coach's system and uh, what they're trying to implement. 
or even, you know, and you can relate that to the real world is, um, you know, what your organization's doing and what you're trying to do that you're buying in. And even to your family life, hey, is, you, know, you, your wife, you, you and your wife got to be on the same page on how you're going to raise kids. So that buying in also becomes a, a big piece. And I think that's kind of where some of this stuff starts, because if people aren't buying in, um, and you're telling a kid, hey, you have to, you have to work, you have to work harder. You're not competing hard enough. Um, this is what we're doing. You have to pass the puck. Well, uh, you know, if his dad's telling him, I'm going to give you a dollar for every goal you score, he's not going to be moving the puck uh, as much as he should. Um, so it, it's definitely the dynamics changed over the years, but it's it's just the constant communication with the kids and t- and, and and taking the time to explain to them, hey, this is what it means in hockey to teamwork. This is what it means. Uh, in real life and, and showing them the correlation, you know, as adults, and to me, I look at it, it's a no brainer. I see it. I've been through it. I've done it. So it, it, it clicks for, for the kids. I think it's, it's an education touch point um, to, to, to take that, take the time to say, you know, you know, when, and I'm, I'll stick with teamwork because we're talking about a team sport of, Hey, this is here. There's teammates that don't always agree, or you don't, this guy on my line for whatever reason, he's not moving the puck. Well, you know, the coach addresses some of that, but part of that is, you know, on the, on the, on the players to go figure out, especially the older you get, um, you have, you have to figure things out, um, and do that. But as a coach, you, you know, you, you talk to, you talk to them and tell them, Hey, you know, if you're in a losing streak, Hey, this is adversity. We got to handle this. We, we can't pout. We can't whine. You have to, you have to put your head down and bear through it. Yeah. You, you know, I always cracks me up as I always, when I was younger, you always used to hear the coaches say, figure it out. Oh. And, and you, you know, there's it really, that's the best phrase for it when you sum it up, because there's just some things you have to figure out. You have the content, you have the information, you have the material. You just have to figure out how to make it work. You know, the information's, you know, for the, assuming that the information has been given to you, it's there. It's just a matter of, Hey, how do we have, we have to use, take, take our individual skill sets and this is one of the examples that I use with my team on uh, on the teamwork side is you have to take your individual skill sets and figure out how to make that work with four other players. Your individual skill sets are very valuable, but they're, they're, the value is in how do you make your individual skill sets work with the five other players and the, and the four other players you're on the ice with in the team concept. And I think, you know, it's, it's kind of that dialogue of explaining that, explaining the kind of those details uh, from the life skill sets to the players and you have the hockey side and you can use an example, but tying it into, um, you know, an example or explaining to them, this is what this means in the real world. Cause eventually they're all going to grow up and be in the real world, whether they're an NHL player, a professional basketball or baseball player, or, you know, if they're sitting doing hosting video chats. So at the end of the day, you got to figure out how to make it work. <laughs> I got a, exactly. I got a couple things there. So yeah. um, one, I think I love, like, I think as parents or just in fact, grown folks, a lot of times we don't recognize that these kids are kids. Their brains aren't developed. They, right. they sound more grown up, but that doesn't mean that they have the experience that we want them to have. So even just explaining simple things like, no, you need to think of this in terms of teamwork. No, you need to think about um, that it is going to be a little bit of figuring it out and that's okay. But like just even verbalizing that gives them the space to open their minds a little bit. So I love that. We do have a question and it kind of goes into a question I have, but Matthew shared and then I'll kind of summarize it with, he wants to know about how to drive home the life skills with the kids when the parents are also in need of it. And I'm going to kind of mush that with my question and it has three parts. So I'll, I'll remind you as we go. One at, one at, a, one at a time. <laughs> They're all the same, just broken up. So what I want to know is if there is one thing that you'd like parents to understand, what would that be? And then just so you know where we're going, if that's okay, but like, sure. what would you like parents to understand? What would you like players to understand? Like, what's the one thing? And your coaches, like you oversee an organization. So in those three aspects, they don't have to be the same for each. But if there's one thing that you could have all your parents have universal understanding of, mm-hmm. what would that be? Well, um, I, I think the, from a parent standpoint is, especially nowadays, I, the parents hover over and there's all kinds of expression, you know, terminology for that mm-hmm. is the, the kids are more capable than I feel the parents give them credit for or want them to experience. Yeah. And having said that is there's 
lessons you learn the easy way and lessons you learn the hard way. Now, uh, a lot of parents want to, uh, again, I, I grew up in a different generation um, and, you know, the parent and I get parents want to protect their kid. But at some point is um, there's going to be some hard lessons. And I use trials as an example. Your kid may not make the team that you that, that you want to make. That's a hard lesson, but you, but it's a life lesson. There's going to be disappointment. Now you're hitting some adversity. What do I do? What do I got to do to get better? Where am I going to go? How do I make that team? Um, and and the kids need to be part of that process to learn. I mean, that going, you know, going through that experience um, and it's always great when, hey, you win a championship and there's trophies and smiles um, and banners and medals. That's great. That's a great experience to learn. But um, and, you know, I don't know anyone in my life that that's their day to day every single day of their life. Um, so it's definitely not my life. I know that, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, the parents have to let the kids experience. Now, if there's issues and things that, that, you know, the coaches are doing that are, you know, aren't appropriate, that's a whole nother thing. And, and that does happen, but there's a lot of, this, I would say that, you know, that's definitely not on the high side of the percentage percentages of what I see. The majority of the time is I, I do think that the parents have to let the kids go, let them learn, let them let them figure things out and let them deliver. And it's not, and it's, there's, it's not always a instant gratification uh, perspective of that positive, Hey, uh, good feeling lessening. Sometimes you have to fight, 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 and fight. And at the end you look back and you go, I accomplished what I wanted. You know, it took me, it took me a season. It took me 18 years. I'm playing in the NHL, however it is, but you had to fight and, and crawl. But at the end of the day is, you know, um, that's what the, I think the sport teaches is, is, is kind of going through those experiences, the good and bad, and you got to let the kids, the kids go through. Cause I really think that the kids are a lot more capable um, where they are. And I find where the parents that let kind of let the coaches coach. And I'm not saying not to, for parents, not to tell their kids, make sure you're working hard, make sure you're listening to coaches, make sure you're, you're doing this and that. Um, and if you're in a predicament where you think you're smarter than the coach, well, then maybe you should go coach or change organizations because telling, telling your son something different um, than what the coach is doing, it just doesn't work. And I see, unfortunately, I see a lot of that as well, where the parents, you know, they try to live through their kids and they do it and they don't let the kids learn and develop. Now, again, if something's inappropriate or it's not a good situation and things are going on, that's, that's a different story. And that's not what I'm referencing from the parents. Oh yeah. Um, well, and it's from the player. Experience. Sorry. Like that, it's a, it's a different experience. Like that's what's so hard from the perspective of, from a parent's perspective, right? It's that, they feel they're coming from a place of, well, I'm an adult now and I know the mistakes I made personally, or I know things, I might know some things about life. So it's it, the, the assumption that, well, since I understand these things about life later on, I'm trying to pass it on to you because you're my child and I want you to understand the mistakes maybe I made or whatever it is. And it's this vicious cycle where, you know, one of the things that, we'll try to argue on with parents on that thought process. Number one, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, life was very different. So your perspective of what is to come later on, you don't know what that is. None of us know, right? We say, we talk about this all the time of how scouts, coaches, everybody, there's no, you can't predict anything. Like you can't predict who's going to win. You can't predict who's going to make it. You can't predict any of that because there's so many things along the way that are going to happen. And again, that's just from what we know from our existence in the game to then, well, wait a second, mom, dad, you had no existence in the game. Like you have nothing to go off of other than what you're experiencing right now with what your kid is doing. So those are two different worlds of, if you were a former athlete, you got one perspective. So at least you've got some kind of perspective, but if you don't have that perspective at all, you're just kind of shooting blanks and well, it's going to be like this, it's going to be like that. And, you, and you're thinking you're controlling a situation where it's hard for parents to understand and be reflective on their own perspective and realize that might not be the clear part of it. So that's a huge struggle, I think, for a lot of parents that they have to deal with. And then from a player's standpoint, the players, who do they trust the most in this world? You trust mom and dad the most. So mom and dad obviously have all the answers, like as much as they might well, fight with us. It weighs a lot more than what they're gonna hear. A hundred percent. So that's the part where for parents, and I can't agree more on that, buddy, of that buy-in piece is so hard because parents have to understand 
wait a second, I influence my kid way more than the coach ever will right now in this term, because that's what they trust. But then from parents' standpoint, your own emotional life that you went through, you have to be careful of, wait a second, it's going to be different. I'm not experiencing the same thing my kid is. And how do I, how do I put that together? It's such an important part to be reflective on it. Yeah, as a parent, we have to recognize it's our, we obviously want to protect our kids. You don't want to be like, yeah, I want to go watch you get hurt. And I don't just mean physically, right? So it's, it's, um, you so badly want it, but we, what we can really do is bite our tongue a little bit, allow them to like breathe and have room to grow. But I kind of have another question. Um, Well, let me, can I just finish up on the player side? You you had asked how to, as a parent, how do you, you know, from, from a player side, it's, you know, the experience and, Going through those experiences, I think, is huge. Like I said, these players are – these kids are extremely capable. And they're, I think they're more capable of uh, – than what the parents kind of want to hold and shelter them to because, you know, honestly, to grow to grow and learn these things is, is you know, there, there's you have to have the good lessons, the hard lessons, and fight through things and figure it out. But you got to let the – you got to let the player have those experiences. And, again, I'm not, I'm not saying if there's – situations that's not healthy and things like that you take them at like that that, that's not what i'm talking about and so from a parent standpoint i feel that you have to let the kids do that you have to let them develop you have to let them to to figure that out and then from a player standpoint is when you're going through them is having the mindset of you know hey this is this is this is how it is this is part of how it is and you just got to keep chipping away at things sometimes and fighting through it and, and, and you know most of the times you know the ups and downs are going to even out or hopefully you have more ups than downs um but you, you got to go through them all and you gotta you gotta you gotta own them as a player you know um and that and you know when you when you do that you're building the character and in, 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 in the self-integrity i'll call it of hey when you face challenges in life you've already experienced this in sports you're just re- relaying it to a different situation uh, when life, uh, life situation. So yeah. it's um, that variety is so important that you're talking about of experiences, right? Like right now um, I love these models that you keep seeing that to continue to pop up of we've got the super team model that did, when we go from nine years old, we're going to go all the way through blah, 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 blah. And it's like, stop, stop. Like, you know how much is going to happen along the way. You know how much like, you're on that team and maybe you now need to go be, maybe you went from right off the bat, you're not the best player on that team, but you are still young. You need to go feel the feeling of being the best player on the team. Like these are the things, a variety experience that is so important at the youth level. And like you said, of like players don't, the, the biggest issue we see with a lot of families is that they feel that it's an all in thing with the same experience all the time like i've got to always be on the top top team always 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 because that's really good for me and it's like no like bring it back to what you're saying the variety of experiences is so much more important that's one of the things we've talked about with belfry before that i loved how he brought it up where he's intentional about how he does it she, you know he, he takes his daughter she's on a, a a team where she's one of the worst she's on a team where she's in the middle then she's one of the best then she's trying out this other uh, scenario. She's never met anybody here. Throw her in with the lions. Like it's stuff like that, that I love of it's so true of like that variety is such an important piece where I feel like people get stuck at the youth levels where they're afraid of the variety, you know, and that's, that's a big thing. You know, and that's a great point because it sometimes it is good to be the big fish in the little pond. There's a lot to learn about leadership and things like that, but there's also times where it's good to step outside of your sandbox you know, and, and be pushed and challenged um, where you're not that, that top player. Um, and, and again, like the, the, staying on the life lessons part is it, it's the same thing in, in, mm-hmm. in the real, in, in the real world. And when, when you, when you grow up, so, um, you know, they're, they're all, it's all about the experiences and, and making sure that you, that you're, you're learning from them and, and, and talking through them. So from a coaching standpoint is you want to make sure you're explaining and talking about the difference between hockey ones. And from, you know, from a parent standpoint, I'm not telling anyone how to, how to, how to parent, but like from a, you know, you want to make sure that they understand some of these things uh, that when they're playing the sport and I can't emphasize enough at how capable these kids are, if you let them go and figure it out when they need help, you help them. But the parents are so quick to jump in now that um, the kids are actually rel- to use an analogy and again it's just an analogy that you know the kids are actually waiting for the kid the parent to go put the puck to put the puck in the net for them because yeah. they're they're you know that's what they're used to 
Well, it's funny. I had an experience years ago where, where when you talk about that, about how they're capable of so much more. So I was helping out with an organization, tier two organization, where you know I had at one of the nights I was out with the Pee Wee B players, and I pushed them like they had never been pushed before. And at the end, you could see they were loving it. They were working hard, all that stuff. Coach comes out to me afterwards and goes, "Hey, listen, uh, you know they're really not used to this. Are you sure we can push them like that?" And all that stuff. And I just go, I, I turn around, and I go, "Look at their faces. What do you think?" And he goes, looks around, he goes, yeah, I guess you're right. Like, it was like, because he was concerned of how hard we were pushing him. I'm like, they're capable of this. Like, they need to get pushed more. Like, they can handle it. Like, and I couldn't agree more with you, man, on that part of, it's such a big part that I see you can come back to. And it's, that's reality, man, is that we can push them a lot harder and a lot more than we do. But because of this whole thing of, oh, like the helicopter ring keeps going, it's like this fear gets kicked in and coaches, the, the main influencers in these things, they're now unconsciously getting afraid to push too much because of this factor of you know, parenting and all that stuff. I was like, I can't, oh, don't push too hard because I got in trouble here. I got in trouble here. And you're right. Like it's, as long as it's safe, as long as that's something that's crazy, I, I think it's a huge missing element of how hard can we actually push to see how far down the rabbit hole we can go with some of these players. I couldn't agree more. So I want to tie this in, especially with that you, you know, have the position that you do with an organization, but what does your organization or what is your recommendation for organizations at what point, like what, what responsibility does the organization have to communicate to parents about in general, what can they expect from your organization, yours or in general, like, but just to communicate on behalf of not just the coach, but as an organization to say, this is what we're trying to accomplish here. You know, we are trying to let the kids try on their own. And if they fail, they fail, but at least they've been able to try. But do you guys communicate as an organization to your parents or is that left to the teams? Do you think there's room for organization, not just yours, but as a whole, you know, to help convey this message to try and make a change so that these kids aren't just waiting for mom and dad to put the puck in the net. And I figure we'll get to oh, yeah, some definitely. questions after this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it kind of starts a lot of it from an organization standpoint can start in your kind of your your mission statement, your goals, which, you know, kind of are up on the on the website, um, you know, or most people have uh, most organizations ha have where people can find it their their customers can find it. Um, but then it's, you know, kind of actually living and executing it. Um, so and that starts with we do we, we try to communicate it in our parent meetings um, to the parents directly from an organization standpoint. Um, but I, the, the real touch point is it's, is, is really the coach come, comes down from the coaches and it starts with, with your coaches selection, making sure you're having the right coaches in there that believe in the values and the, and the things that you're trying to teach. Um, and, and cause they're at the end of the day, they're the ones touching the kids every, you know, all the practices and stuff like that as the leaders of the organizations, you want to make sure that the information and materials out there, and then, you know, it's getting getting to the parents one way or another, but then it's really the, the, the coaches that are kind of dry, the driving force of that. You know, they're also, you know, they're touching the parents. They're the ones touching the parents the most as well and making sure, you know, I can tell you right now, there's nothing, there's nothing worse than having a coach that you're not on the same page with from an organization standpoint. Um, and it, it, it may, it, it makes it for a very tough situation. And at the end of the day, it does affect, um, affects the players, teams, and parents, um, where you, where you're on the same, from an organization standpoint, you got to make sure you have your, your values and things are aligned with who you're putting in there. Cause they're, again, they're the ones touching, touching the, touching the customers and the players and teaching the, those lessons. So it really comes down from an organization standpoint is make sure you have your clear message and it's out there so for everyone to see parents, but also your coaches. And then when you're putting, picking your coaches and putting your coaches in, in place, make sure you have the right one. And it's no different than in the real world. If you're, you're hiring an employee, you got to make sure that you have the right employee because at the end of the day, it's just not going to work out and it becomes a stress and a, a bad situation for, for everyone. So, you know, you, from an organization standpoint, you have to be organized in that message and then, you know, make sure you have the right coaches and you're driving it down to them. And you're working from an organization standpoint, you're working with your coaches as well to drive it down. Um, I try to, interact with the parents as much as I can other than, Hey, why isn't my kid on the double A team or triple A team? And why did you put my kid here? Um, but, you know, you know, from a leadership standpoint is, I mean, there is some of that that goes on that you need to do and being around so they know who you are and what, you, what kind of, you know, pretty much if, 
for my organization, whether you agree with me or not, you kind of understand where some of this stuff's coming from and what I am and what kind of what I do and live through. And again, there's some people that don't agree with it and that's fine too. Um, but you, you, you know what you're getting in and we kind of drive that down into the coaches because they're the ones that are communicating and touching to the players, you know, four or five times a week. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's that answer just, that. No, no, no. Well, right. So yeah, and that's that's the biggest part, right? Is the the message being consistent, right? Of how much, like like you said, of like from an organizational standpoint, putting it out there. But I think that's the part that it's it's hard for parents to appreciate the fact of an organizational leader has a vision, and I'm sure as time has gone on, it's gotten easier for you to start picking out and going, okay, this, this person will fit, this person doesn't you obviously get better as time goes on, but it's it's not a perfect process because no matter how we spin it, the moment the team starts to lose, the moment the team starts to struggle, there's this pressure that comes on the coach that again, depending on what type of parents you have, it can create a stir. Like this is something that we deal with so often of where, and I love the quote of like how you talked about, you know, you've got to figure out with players of like how to work with the other four. It's the Jim Rohn quote, right? You are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. And it's such a true statement on that end. And so for parents to understand, coaches, organizational leaders do their best to put somebody in place that's passionate, that wants to do it. But when it goes haywire, it's so easy to, for a parent to not not appreciate the fact that if the coach is treating you well, you're going to look at that coach and say, oh, everything's fine. But if the coach is holding your kid, if if the coach is holding, you're the one holding your kid accountable, your, your feelings get butt hurt a lot of times, like because of the fact that well, my kid, you know, shouldn't be held accountable like that. And the reality is this is where that gray area comes in with coaching and organizational leadership is where organizational leadership, it's like a boss that's never there, right? You're, you don't see what's going on day to day. You don't see the behavior of how this kid is acting. So I'm trying to, from my perspective, understand how to help the situation, how to remedy. But then the parent is same thing. The parent is just seeing it from afar and hearing it from a kid that doesn't know ultimately what they're thinking or saying. All they know is, well, I'm mommy and daddy at home. Get, let me do whatever I want. And now this person is trying to hold me accountable to something. And that's really upsetting me. Like this is, you know, this person doesn't like me because this person is just trying to hold you accountable to something. And so because and that happens a lot, it, hap- it happens a lot. And, I mean, look, those who don't know me from a coaching standpoint, I'm a very demanding coach. It's probably oh, yeah. the nicest way to put it. Um, yeah. But I, the accountability and responsible. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, as long as you're communicating stuff that, uh, to the players and it's your job to make sure they understand it. But, you know, when, when they're not doing it, it's also your job to, to tell them and, the, the other part is, is when they're, when they're young is you're doing a lot of coaching and instruction. They're going to make just as many mistakes as they are going to do, uh, you know, make good decisions or at least be in situations where um, they need to be coached. And again, it goes back to the experience in my point, you got to let your, your kids be coached. You got to let them uh, experience that. And Hey, uh, you know, a kid may have a tough first six months of the year in the last four months, it turns on. I've seen, I've seen that where, Hey, you know, and the kid's down and, it, you know, you try it from a coaching standpoint, you're, you good coaches kind of have a feel for their player and you, their players and where they are. And, you know, I, every year I, there, there, there's some kids that go through it, uh, I, that I deal with where you're, you're tempering and kind of managing how you're going to hold them accountable because you still got to hold them accountable. Um, and, but you, you can't always just keep, beating them but you still got to hold them accountable and there and there's uh you know that the fine line of you don't want to lose that player right you don't want to lose them you want to keep them roped in but hey they're they the player has to get to where they need to be and execute and do the things that you want to do so um at the end of the day the players play the game right and uh it takes longer it takes longer for some than others um to get it like i said there's some 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 kids start off the year great and they go, they dive down and then you ride them and they come back up and stuff like that. There's some kids that start, you know, they start down here and they just, and then they trickle up or some kids, it just clicks as they say with some of them. But if you're just not 
giving up on kids, not sticking to it. And that's why the way I look at it is, hey, listen, uh, you know, I could not say something to you be just because it's easier at this point because you're struggling with it and you're not, you know, you think I'm the biggest jerk in the world. But at the end of the day is you need to do what this is what the team is. This is what you need to do. Um, I'm not going to give up on you. Now, you may not like it, um, but, you know, at the end of the day is we, we got to get that change and that click to get you to either. And, and a, a bunch of this starts back to something I mentioned before with the buying in, um, the buying in. When you buy in, things seem to be a lot either. A lot, they, they go a lot easier. Um, not that you're, when you buy in, not that you're not going to have uh, ups and downs as well, but it's kind of, it starts with the, the, the buying in. And then, you know, again, it's the experience of, hey, I got to, I got to fight through this. And maybe it's two weeks, maybe it's two months. I, I've seen it all. And I've had, you know, I've coached players where they step right in and you barely have to say anything to them. <laughs> I think you know what I mean? You, they listen the first time and they, 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 they get it. Um, but you know, that they're kind of the exception is, you know, most kids, you just get, you got to stay on them. You got to keep, you got to keep with them and explaining to them and finding ways to different approaches to, to different approaches to try to get a click if what you're not doing isn't working. But at the end of the day is the players play the game. So they have to, to stay with it. And the coach's responsibility is to stay with them on those, on those things. And again, it, it, it ties back into to life skills. There's th different different parts of our life that you go, th that everybody goes through. Um, some are short, some are long and um, they're just experiences that you got to figure out how to manage through. Yeah, exactly. That's the toughest part. And I, and I know we have some questions on yeah. that, but that's, uh, that's the toughest part is the experiences you have to manage through. I think that's what creates, because like when you say buy-in to me, right? Buy-in is nothing more than trust. It's the same thing, right? I trust the information you're giving me. I trust and I feel safe in the environment that I'm at. These are all the factors that take sometimes years to build, right? And then the problem with a big thing in our culture is the moment something didn't work the one year, you want to jump to the next organization. So now you're trying to rebuild trust and you're going to keep reliving the same thing over and over again, right? Like it's just and, and like having that long-term thing is such an important part that's really we've lost on that end. But that's the part that's such a driver for me of building trust and confidence in yourself and your abilities because you can't fake your instincts. So the faster we point out, prove. Don't just say you should be doing it. Don't just say you should be on the power play. Don't just say you're a goal scorer. Do you have the ability to actually have proof in your own mind to show you, well, if you're going to say these things, show me. Show. Don't tell us that you believe these things. It's nice. We all believe. But – we can't trust you any more than you can't trust yourself if you don't actually show the end result. And so that's, that's and a big what I think too, that buying in the word that resonates with me is growth mindset. Oh yeah. That yeah. the family needs to be open-minded to buying into whatever, like when you like right now, you guys are all going out to tryouts, right? I hope it's not just about what your kid's doing on the ice, but that you're yeah. educating yourself and asking questions to yeah. coach the organization to get the answers you need so that you're comfortable to buy in. Yeah. It's not just about, did your kid make the team? It's whether or not that team is a good fit for your kid and your family. You know, is the rink two hours away? Is it, you know, like there's lots of, in, there's lots to that environment that's gonna um, help you to buy in more, but you can't just, don't just buy in because the name on the jersey, mm -hmm. because that's not going to help you in the long term. You need to know, letter. or the letter, mm -hmm. you need to know what's right for you and what you're really looking for. You know, if you're looking, maybe you, I need to be challenged a bit more with a faster paced games next year or practices. Okay. Well then you need to know that you need to ask questions like the right questions and Mitch, correct me if I'm wrong, because I know you'd love to, but like a good coach <laughs> is happy to answer good questions. Like, uh, you know, not the what line do you see, you know, but where do you see my kid fitting into the mix? Where do you think they're, you know, but and again, we always talk about tone, timing and target when talking to a coach or an organization. But, you know, it's important that you ask those questions because you do need to buy in and you need to get yourself the answers now and try out so that you're able to say not just that they took your kid, but that you took the organization and that coach. It's a buy in all around. So mm -hmm. You know, I think that's really important that we, that, that you have that, to me, buying in is growth mindset. And mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be the way you think it's going to be. You're willing to buy into the environment that you're going into. Exactly. You guys want to get, sure. uh, oh, go ahead. 
I shouldn't say I don't think any from an organization or players, no one, at least I don't think, goes into a, a situation going, man, I hope this doesn't work out. <laughs> exactly. You, you know what I mean? Um, there, there's, you know, there's sometimes questions on it, but like the, I, I, they're, they're fair questions of, hey, like, you know, like, what do you have? Like, do you, how many returning players do you have? Do you have 6D? You know, or do, do you think, where do, does my, where does, do you think my kid falls into your lineup if, if he makes it? Um, the other thing with tryouts is, and, and this is, again, I try to take the gray area out of some of these things as much as possible because when you're, when, 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 when you operate in a gray area, that's where you kind of get you get a lot of anxiety and things don't work and stress and stuff. It's yeah. hey, if if there's nine players, if they're taking nine forwards, don't shoot to be the ninth forward. Right. Make it a no brainer for the for the coach, right? Because what's going to happen at tryouts and uh, I, I, I give you the analogies for the forwards and the defensemen and even the goalies. And I experienced this last night and so on. You know, I had three three parents tell me teams were pre picked. No, they weren't pre picked. Your kids were in the mix and they got outperformed. Um, you were, you were, you know, so that, that when you go in, when you take that mindset, do politics happen? Yeah. Do I, from at least from our organization and, and, and a lot of what I see out there, uh, it's not, it doesn't happen to the extent the parent, the parent says it does, but go, if you're going to be, if you were, if you're hoping to be the eighth or ninth forward, what's going to happen is for that eighth or ninth forward spot, that coach is looking at probably three to five players to fill that in. Uh, so your chances of making that team is, you know, it, your percentage at that point and the things that go into, into those spots are, and, you know, some coaches like, maybe they like us, they want to, they want speed. They need a speedy winger. Maybe it's a small team. And they're looking for a big, strong guy for a defenseman. You know, the one last one or two defensive spots, there's probably, you know, three or four players trying to get in that. Um, you know, and may, hey, do you have all offensive and puck moving and skating defensemen? So you need a defensive defenseman. So you kind of pigeonhole yourself when when you're kind of in those spots where be one of the top guys picked and it becomes it's a performance thing. Go out there and do the best and kind of like don't talk the talk, walk the walk. Don't put yourself in that situation where you're, you know, a, a bubble pick because now you're you're in the mix where, you know, you, you can ask depending if there's five people there, you, you, you could get three to five different opinions on who should take those two last spots. So you create uncertainty for yourself. And now you, players aren't doing that on purpose, but that's kind of the reality of, of, of what, what happens. Um, so my advice is, you know, go out there and be a no brainer. Make, make the coach take you, make the coach take you, force him to where you have, if it's happened at my tryout and I'm watching it, I'm going to go to my coach and go, how are you not taking this kid? Right. And that's where the organization needs to step in. And, and, and you know, from our standpoint, we do kind of, we make sure we monitor and ma manage that as best as possible. So the right kids are making the right teams, but from a player standpoint, I got to say, rarely do you see a kid who's the best kid on the ice and the coach doesn't take them because he says he doesn't belong. So that you know, you go out there and perform and produce and make the co force the coach to take you. Exactly. And I would say, like, I think that's amazing for our parents to hear because that's probably the biggest dose of reality that you can hear. And you don't have to love it, but it is what it is the fact of what this is. If it's competitive sport, it's a competitive sport. It's not it's not in-house. You know what I mean? It's it there is some level that it goes with playing a competitive sport. So, you know, don't hate the player, hate the game, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> It's, um, you know, this is really important for, for you guys to hear. And I hope that you can take with that the experience of what's happening here. And um, no, I think it's pretty real, pretty raw. And I think it's great. No, exactly. No, it's, it's, it's great advice, right? Because at the end of the day, again, it does come down to performance. And that's the biggest life skill I think there is. Like, I, I like to call it the 1% of everything. Like, no matter what you dive into, if you really want to earn a living, make an impact on any industry, you, you name it. You've got to become a part of that 1%. The 1% are just the best of the best. That's it, no matter what you're doing. So getting picked on any of these teams, it's because you fell into, you were one of the best. Like you were the best at whatever you did. The shooter, you block shots, face off. I mean, all these different things of hockey analogy, but it's the same thing in life. But like, you know what? Really good communicator, really good team person, you know, pumps everybody up, whatever, all those things. But knowing your identity and what you bring when you go to these trials, 
is a huge part. And we've talked about this before of what's going to make you noticeable where again, bringing it back to what you're saying, it makes it so it's like, yeah, for you have to take, look, look at that kid. I mean, the energy that kid brings it doesn't even have to be the most skilled. It's just the amount of energy you bring. It's like, man, you know what? I can use that in practice all the time. I can use it in the game to just point out, look at that effort. That's the kind of effort we Rudy, need to see all the time. Rudy. Like Rudy, it's right. the truth. But like Rudy's make teams all the time because you don't see other kids that are doing it like that. So it's like, you know what? If I can use that every single week to talk about it, we're, that's what we're going to do. We're going to, you're on that team because man, you work so hard. Like you have to be a part of our crew. Well, and I would say as parents, stop adding to the, the myth factor. Oh my God, the team's pickle four. Oh my God, I heard of this player or this happening or that happening. If you're spending the time and energy finding those, I'm not saying it doesn't, but instead put your energy where it's going to help you rather than finding those stories to break, you know, holes in the theory. Like what coach Mitch here is talking about is ultimately the majority of what's happening. Yes. You're going to hear stories of other things, but don't put your energy poking holes in it into the stories put it in this is the majority of what's going on right. not saying every organization across the land and every team but this is in fact how it really is most of the time yeah there's bad apples there's bad apples in life how many of you have had a bad boss like you took a job and the company ended up being terrible like you know there, but does that mean every job in every company on the planet is bad and you shouldn't look for a job anymore no but don't give the myths and the legends of all of these things that go around, right? And coaches have them too. You know, it's not just a one-sided thing, but don't give energy to that because this is the majority. This is what's really happening. Yeah, and, and, to, and to, to add to that, um, you know, on you know, when you're in there is, you know, something that I see that uh, coaches look at, and I don't know that parents or even players realize what coaches look at from a player standpoint. And you talked about a rah-rah guy and this and that is body language. Um, especially if you're one of those bubble players, if you're one of the kids that's slamming his stick, going to the bench with his sh shoulders down or whatever, I, from, from a hockey standpoint, that's what I, one of the biggest things I look at is kind of what, what's the character, what's your character and your integrity that you bring to the ice? Are you pounding and whining because you didn't get your own way? And I tell my kids this all the time. I hate to tell you, if you're playing five five on five scrimmage at tryouts, not only are the five guys you're playing with trying to make that team, the five guys that you're playing against are trying to make that team and not let you be successful. It's their job not to let you be successful. So playing through that and pouting and whining, slamming your stick, and I, I, I've, I've seen it all. I heard it all. One powder on a Coach Mitch team, and that's Coach. Mitch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so but that's that's the that's the benefit of being the coach yeah exactly well, i'm here to and, i'm not really here for anything else that's, 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 that's what you're best at <laughs> yeah. and the and the other thing from a parent standpoint and i i i, I do want to bring this up because it, it does happen is there are parents that are just unmanageable and coaches and organizations just don't want to deal with them yeah. and, and they end up hurting their kid um and it's them and it's them that's the part that's so hard for them to realize it is and then they're, not your kid yeah exactly and there's there and it and, and a lot of what i see it's actually not the kid <laughs> you know the, the, it's the it's the nicest kid the sweetest kid and you know sometimes he's a good hockey player sometimes maybe he's trying out for a b team or whatever um but there's just organization and coaches that just don't want to deal with the parents because the parents are you know, they're hard to deal with or their issues. And at the end of the day is, you know, there's enough players out there where you can get the player that you want and not have to deal with. And I'm not saying that you don't have a right to voice your opinion to do this, but there's, there's also a line that parents cross where they become to the point where you're just not going to take them. You don't want them on your team. You don't want them in your organization and they're cancers. And unfortunately they're there. Like, and again, it's a real life thing that they're in real life in the real world. Um, so my advice to the parents is don't be the reason your kid doesn't make a team. But I also want to say that I think that's an outlier as well. I think parents, you don't have to be afraid to talk to coach or to talk to someone in the organization. It's all about your approach and how you're taking it. But because I do, I don't feel like most parents are like that. No, I think no, those are the far and few between. Right. But it's the exception. Off yeah. Some parents from 100%. like wanting to get answers and there's nothing wrong with wanting because to get answers. Because they don't want to be, they don't want to be labeled that parent. Yes. What they don't realize is that parent earned a reputation to become that parent. 
You don't like you don't black. It doesn't it doesn't happen once on one team or one organization. No, it happens exactly. over time. Exactly. Especially locally. Everything's such a small world. All the coaches, for the most part, yeah, get competitive. But like everyone pretty much knows each other, talks to each other, and it gets out fast of like, oh, that's hey, listen, hey, the kid's a good kid, you know, but no, taking in, be warned. This yes. is what you're dealing with. If you can deal with that this year, go for it. But just know this is what you're gonna get of the baggage. And the more that keeps happening every year, eventually it's just like you've used up too many cards where it's like, okay, yeah, that's who you're dealing with. Now that parent has to travel three, four hours away because it's like no one really knows them enough. It's just enough where everyone knows, oh, I like the kid, but yeah, the parent, okay. Oh yeah, all right, well, the parent's fine. But I would and they don't realize the parent, history. Like, so I think those parents have no awareness mm -hmm. that they're like that. So if mm -hmm. you're a parent and you're trying to be sensitive to coach about what you're saying, you're probably fine to say it because you're being at least considerate and thoughtful exactly. about what you want to say, how you want to say it, you know, when's a good time to say it. If you're going through those steps, you're probably okay to go talk to coach. Exactly. I have a feeling the ones that are what you guys are speaking of they're probably don't think about that. No, they're not thoughtful. No, and they cause issues with other parents as well. It's not usually not just the coach. There, yeah. there there's there's other tentacles oh, that it goes out from. Yeah. And so you can and you can, uh, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. There's nothing wrong. There, there, to Marissa's point, there's a big, there's, to me, it's, it's, it's not a great, there's a, it's black and white. There's a big difference between, hey, having questions and concerns and addressing them properly. And then there's the, the parents you want nothing to do with. They're, 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 they're two completely different things. And the, the players, the parents like that, and sometimes it is the player too, um, that you just don't want on your team. Uh, or and, and and your other players don't want them just because they're they're lousy teammates and unfortunately the, you know it, it happens there's lousy teammates oh. um, and so but there again that's on the exception side um, so for the players and parents just don't don't do that you know enjoy the experience enjoy the ride and put yourself in a good situation ask the questions so you know where you're going. Um, put yourself with a good organization and put yourself with a good coach. At the end of the day, everyone has – anybody can get on the ice anytime they want, right? Anybody can get a power skating coach, a stick handling guy. Anybody, you know, uh, can do that. Every, everyone has access to the same things nowadays. Um, so, um, you know, put yourself – find the organization, the coach that you want to be with, and hopefully, you know, your your sons or daughters are good enough to make it. But, you know, that's part of the due diligence, due diligence process that goes goes in, goes into it. Exactly. The coach you want to be, that's such a huge important piece, you know, that you try to help people understand is that like I, I deal with it with the college guys sometimes I'm like the younger players as they're going through the recruiting process and all that, you know, we're always like, listen, go with the coach. You feel that feels the best. Do not get shiny object. Wow. This school looks awesome. Oh my God. The school has nothing to do with it. So much of it does have to do with the coach. Who's the gatekeeper that really wants to develop you. Cause ultimately that's why you're going there. Right. Is that to have an experience. And the coach, right? coaches ultimately build programs and stuff like that. They're the ones that people want to follow that are good coaches, right? If you're a jerk and all that stuff, it's a different story, right? But you're not going to last. Are we allowed to say? Are we allowed to say that on TV? No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's Facebook Live. <laughs> but that's the reality, right? But it's such an important piece of yes, like do your homework on the coach. If the coach has been around long enough, you know now what you're getting involved with. If it's a young coach, well then you have to be aware of. Again, like you said, going from being a player to a coach might be a nice kid, but you have to realize as a parent, okay, you know what? There's going to be some growing pains, but I really like this kid's attitude. Nice kid, going to coach my kid. Okay, and I've got to accept it's not going to be perfect. So these are the different parts that you just have to be aware of in that process of identifying who the right coach and the right fit is. But you should always get a feeling coming off of the coach of this coach really likes my kid or likes me. Like you should feel that feeling at the youth level, especially at the older levels. It's a different story. It's more performance based, but at the youth levels, you should feel some kind of connection where it's like, okay, I can see myself. This person cares about me. I care about them. Like there's gotta be that thing there. You shouldn't be picking coaches that you feel nothing towards other than, well, this coach is connected. So they're going to help me. Like, yeah, right. The, the connected coaches, if you don't feel that connection, they're not helping you. It's a yeah, and, and just because a coach is coaching you or hard on you or like whatever, it doesn't mean he doesn't like you from a player standpoint or even a parent standpoint. Again, now I'm a, I'm a good example for this because I'm a demanding coach is, hey, man, I care for these kids so much that I coach. And I, I think of most, 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 most coaches do, especially at the youth level, they're volunteers or they're not making a whole lot of money. 
they love hockey, they love teaching the kids, um, is, you know, no, it's not that they don't like you. Like, if the coach did, if the coach didn't care, it wouldn't be what the coach goes home and sits about all night, and your wife goes, Mitch, what's wrong with you? Well, I'm struggling <laughs> with struggling with Johnny, and I I'm struggling to figure out how to get through. I know he's not happy with me, you know, and, the, and and I know I'm not the only coach that goes through it. Is it, it, it eats you up. It eats you up. And you, and you try to figure it and where you're like, I, I got to get them to, to do X, Y, or Z or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, it's not – it's definitely at least, you know, f- from our organization standpoint and, you know, the people that – coaches I know and associate with, they, they love it so much that it bothers them on a personal level. Um, that's how much they care about the kids. Exactly. That's reality. You want me to dive yeah. in? Okay. Yeah, Pia, I feel that some parents like to pair their kids with better players or teams with the hope their kids will catch up. So I think that was more, mm-hmm. um, you know, I guess the word on not, you know, wanting to put your kid, I guess, with better players. Joseph Rivera, the camera does add a couple hundred pounds to you, right? Mitch checking for charity is around the corner and you said you would be in shape. <laughs> um, it is. My wife bought me an elliptical and I haven't been on it yet. Yeah, her, that was her, that was her subtle way of telling me. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy, it's good for kids to experience loss. Matthew DiMatteo, I have always felt that from a development aspect, it's much better to be the top player on a lower level team than the fourth player on a top team. I've seen too many kids under pressure to survive their shifts, afraid to make mistakes rather than actually have the puck on their stick and be able to make plays. Yeah. Again, it depends on where. And you're I, I want to. Can I touch on that one? I, that's and that's a good point. Um, and it goes back to a little bit of what we talked about being the big fish in the little pond and when to get out of the sandbox. I can tell you right now, with the exception of one of the top players that I've coached in the NHL, Connor McDavid. Uh, he's the only player that I can think of off the top of my head that played on kind of the East Coast select teams and stuff that played up his whole career. He played with, he's a 97 play with the 96s. A lot of the players that, that I, that I coach at least up until you get to maybe Bantams or U16, then you kind of start kind of Bantam major and U16. And then I, I think the, the dynamic changes, changes a little bit and um, where you, you kind of got to make some other decisions, but is playing your own birth year and dominating. There's just skill ship, skill sets and leadership things that you learn by dominating um, that and, and controlling a game. you know, it's, it becomes the game inside the game and knowing how, how to control the game. Hey, this team may be better on paper, but if I know I can manage and control the game when I'm on the ice and doing this and that mm-hmm. and, and to help my team win, that there, there are things that kids can figure out. Um, so I'm not, uh, it also goes to, I think it was, uh, Pia's point as well about pushing and playing uh, your kid. I, I, there is something to, Hey, playing with better kids and practicing with better kids and, and going and go and, and going that there, there's no doubt about that, but there's two caveats to that. And I have this conversation a lot. One is, is there's no shortcuts. What you put in is what you get out. You know uh, if you, if, if you think the sole reason that you're going to get to the next level is because you played with this kid or played with that. It's not true because I can name just as many kids that came from small Western Canada t- towns and they played with their town teams. So to they were that Bantam and midget age level that are playing in the NHL. And there was a study years ago about uh, the, the amount of Western Canada kids in the NHL. And you got to remember in Western Canada, they're very spread out. So these kids play in their own towns and stuff. Now there's some travel great distances and whatnot that even in Europe, it's kind of the same thing. They develop in their organization. So it, it's, there is something to the side of practice and playing with better players, no doubt. And at, at a pace and a higher level, it forces you, but it really comes down to is take the same, same player. If he's in a small town, he's probably going to end up at the same place. If he puts it, if he puts in the work ethic, he's getting a, a similar coaching. He's putting in the work ethic and driving himself until, until a certain age where, where you, you got to move on. And cause you, the other thing is you don't develop by not playing. Right. You don't develop by not playing, in my opinion, right? So why go to a team where you're going to be on the fourth line and where you can, if you play on another team, you're going to be on the first or second line. I, my personal opinion is, is you get better by playing at the, when you're young. You don't get better uh, playing sitting on the bench. Exactly. And that's where the foundational element is so important. Right? You're laying the foundation. This is the argument we'll always make of like, it's a nervous system thing. Right? It's like the more emotionally confident, the more you, the better you feel at six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 
you're building up, right? That emotional kind of capital and that of, I feel confident, I feel good. Then once you start hitting that 14, 15 mark, well, welcome to real life. That's high school. That's naturally hormonally what starts to happen through puberty. It just naturally starts to happen that you go to that place of, okay, I've got to figure things out and it's tougher. But when the kids are younger, the reality is, man, you've got to feel good, good, good. And like you said, feel the game, experience confidence with the puck, feel the control that you have definitely is a huge piece. You, you, you don't want to have too much of the struggle. It shouldn't, if every year you're struggling, 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 there's eventually going to be like, okay, I need a break. There's a breaking point where it's like, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. And you're never going to have the confidence with the puck and, and things like that. Like you said, there's, no, there's just the confidence that, that you get that the only way you get it is by playing and being that guy, being on the power play, the penalty kill, and being in those situations, uh, certain situations, and being in a situation where – and I, I don't just want to say with the puck because you play the game with and without the puck, but being one of the better kids and even being you know just as solid defensively as you are offensively for those kids and being able – you know, one of the biggest underrated uh, skill sets I, I feel in hockey is, is the defensive side of the puck. And going into a one-on-one -on -one battle, whether you have the puck or not, whether it's a loose puck race, whether they have the puck or you have the puck, whatever scenario it is, is knowing when you go into that battle that you're coming out with the puck. And that's that's a skill set that it, uh -huh. the game is played in little battles, little races, as everyone knows, all over the ice. And that's something that you learn and a confidence that I feel you learn where you're constantly in those situations and learning how to win those um, consistently. And that, that that ties into that leadership type player. You know, there's just certain players, you know, you watch the NHL, when there's a one-on-one -on -one battle, you know, nine times out of 10, this guy's coming out with the puck. You know, Sidney Crosby is a great example and things like that. And and it's not always about having the puck on your stick. It could be a foot race or even, hey, you're on the defensive side of the puck. You're in your zone knowing, hey, I'm going in the corner with this with this guy. I'm coming out with the puck and starting to break out. Exactly. I just read an article about how uh, with Zach Hyman, right, of how basically when he was in college, his coach wrote him like there was no tomorrow. Uh, it was a baron center. It was all over him about the defensive side of the puck. Like he's like, to play in the NHL, that's a non-negotiable. You have to have that. And he, you know, he learned through the college level playing at division one level where it, he realized, but it took him a long time to buy into that concept. And here's a player that's all in committed, but there was clear as day of the defensive side. If you want to play in the NHL, you have to understand this side of the game and it's just non-negotiable. So yeah, it's a big part that at the youth level is, is a huge issue as a whole that we have as a culture for sure, that we're not teaching enough of that part because then when kids get older, they're all struggling with something that's completely non-negotiable, but it's because, well, who taught it to, who taught it to you coming up? And it's, and it's the easiest part of the game, to be honest yeah, with you, yeah, I mean, move, 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 cool. getting the puck, yeah. yeah, getting the puck, moving the puck around five guys and scoring on the goalie is actually hard. Yes. <laughs> exactly. staying, staying, staying between your man in the net and finding your man getting taken away the middle of the ice and staying between your man in the net is pretty freaking easy. You know, the, like it, it's not, you just got to want to do it. Playing without the puck is, it, 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 there's a, some, a skill to it, but it starts with a desire to want to play without the puck. If you don't have that desire, I don't care how offensive you are, you have a cap on how far you're going to go in hockey because you have to play. And something I talk about with my team a lot because let's just say all things being equal, the other team has the puck 50% of the time, you have the puck 50% of the time. Well, that means 50% of the game, not only is the puck not even on your stick, your team doesn't have it. So you have to get it back. So you, you got to want to get the puck back. And the more you want to get the puck back, the quicker you get it back, the less the other team's going to have it. And your offense actually starts and, and your puck possession starts when you don't have the puck to get it. Now, obviously you have to manage the puck when you get it to keep it, but you know, all things being equal, you got to imagine your team doesn't have the puck being 50% of the time is you got to figure out how to get it. So you have it 70% of the time and the other, and the other team has it 30% of the time. And, and it, it's a desire and a will. Um, there's, there's skill and techniques involved in a well, but it starts with the desire and the will to do that. Yeah. All right. I'm going to get into these next set, section of like questions and comments. And before we do, I kind of want to like preface it with, and it relates very much to this, but as parents, I think we're trying to control too much. I think we're trying to find the magic formula to get from A to B or A to Z. And 
there, you could have two children and try and follow the same exact system year to year to year. And I'm sure you know your two kids, even if you they don't play, like it's not possible. There is no one way. There is no always correct answer. So I think we need to keep that in mind as parents when we're going through this. Yes, we're trying to be, we want to do the right thing. We want to do our due diligence and our research, but some of it is a little bit of letting go, letting go of the control being a little bit uncomfortable. And then that kind of leads me into these next uh, comments and questions. But Jim Wiggins, regarding not jumping in too early as a parent and letting them figure it out, how much failure is too much? When does the kids start to give up? And um, then there was this whole conversation kind of happening here. Uh, Mark Force, none as far as safe failure at a high level is necessary for all of us. Um, I'll just read it and then you guys can discuss. Jim Wiggins, I'm thinking about the balance between learning from experiences and also learning to help develop confidence. At some point, if a kid fails and fails and fails, at some point, uh, they may start to believe I'm just not good enough. Mm -hmm. um, and what's important about that, yeah. as you keep going, right? And what's what's so important, and that's why we lo I love the stuff that we instilled our guys, right? Is that that confidence sometimes, you've got to see that's why proof is so important right? Is the result. Most players, the only, it's that buy-in factor that kicks in, right? Where most players, if you don't understand what value you bring and you don't buy into something the coach is saying, that's the only reason most of the time that confidence gets shot is because you're not trying something that works. You're not seeing a result happen of something. There's always one thing that every kid does that you're really good at that. And if you can point that out and allow that kid to experience that over and over again and feel that experience, that's that play for that feeling and see like, wow, I do bring value here. I'm good at this. That builds confidence. But if, but if your experience is nonstop, negative, 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 and you never see the result of something working, then yes, of course, eventually it can get there. And, and to answer that question of what, where does it happen? Everyone's different. Everybody's different, right? By, by all accounts, I shouldn't be in the game anymore. I should be going of how many times cut, failed, fired, bad, you name it, and still here. So but it's I, like, I think everyone's different on that side of the give up factor. Well, and I think it depends on how you're framing failure with your kids. Like, yeah. and I always go back to kind of making a weight loss analogy because I think it's something we can all understand. Watch, the, watch, watch, watch where you're going with this one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hear me out, but I'm just saying like, if you've ever tried to lose weight, and all you do is focus on the number on the scale, it's gonna feel like a lot of failure. But if you focus on, today I ate my five servings of fruits and vegetables. Today I drank the amount of water I was supposed to. Those are what we call in the business non-scale victories, right? So how can you apply that same methodology to what's going on in your game? It doesn't have to be, I didn't score a goal, therefore I'm a failure. I didn't play as much ice time as I want, therefore I'm a failure. I didn't get that play down yet, therefore I'm a failure. But like, did you do one little thing better? How are you framing what's happening? And I think it's important that oh, we yeah. look at that as 100%. where, how are we improving? If it's just black and white, if you're not journaling, if you're not looking at all the little aspects of your game. Yeah. Maybe you fail, but instead of being down and slamming the stick on your eyes, you're like, you didn't that time. You just accepted it and went back. You know, that's a big win. Like it doesn't yeah. always yeah. have to be the big moments in the game that means that you're having success. Right. Because if we're training, you know, if we're doing this for life skills, then that's a bigger lesson than scoring the goal. Yeah. Um. So that well, and the and the tie to tie into that and that, that uh, I think was Jim Jim's kind of comments is. I think there's a couple different uh, levels to it. And I think, Marissa, you hit your analogy, hit uh, the nail on the head where I think it starts. I mean, I think it starts with buying in and under, uh, buying, it starts with buying in and understanding what's, you know, what, what what's expected. Yeah. But then it, it's kind of the details. I always tell my kids, play the game the right way. Do the details. The game matters. You shouldn't at the higher age levels. You shouldn't miss passes. You should, you know, you should be getting open. You should be back checking. You should be, you know, uh, starting on the defensive side of the puck. You should know when to drive the net. You shouldn't be trying to toe drag guys one on three and things like that. And you know, then it goes into tying. And so it starts with the with the foundation and playing the game the right way and doing the basics. That, you know, I always say this, and everyone, you know, uh, thinks I'm nuts is. Hockey is a game of the basics just over and over and over and over and over again. 
you know, and then you add some skill set and stuff like that. But when you're playing a game, you're consistently doing the basics to you get a breakdown in the other team to create an opportunity, you know, um, and, and, it, and it, from an individual level, it's the same thing. And you're consistently doing your own basics, like right, right. Left team, bring it down to the personal level. Exactly. You're stopping and starting. You're competing on pucks. You're getting open. You're not missing pucks. Your head's up. You know, you're not the. You know, uh, this is one of the things I see, and I see it even at, at the elite level. The first thing players want to do is stick handle the puck when the puck hits their stick. They don't know what they're doing with the puck before they get it. You know, a lot of times is you don't even need the stick handle. You know, you're catching the puck, you're moving it, and now you're skating the space to get the puck back. Things like that. You know, and they're just the basic details. Um, so it starts with your foundation, you know, that's kind of the, are you eating your fruit and everything else? Like, um, you, you, you said Marissa and you play the game the right way. And, and a great example of that is when you see the NHL guys, they don't do a whole lot of stuff. I mean, in the spring and summer, they play, you know, some charity events or they, you know, they'll play in leagues against their buddies. Those guys are so well-trained. They don't want to play open hockey. They don't want the bad skill. They don't want the bad habits. They work their whole life to get all the bad habits out of their game. They know how to play hockey one way, the right way. And that's got to be your goal. And, and it's, there's, the, there's many different facets to it, but it, uh, to that comment of play the game right way. But if that's your foundation, a way to get it. And you got to keep going that. And then, you know, the other part of that is put, your, put yourself in, how are you looking at the failure and – if it's not working as you, you know, maybe you need to take a step back and reevaluate kind of where am I at? Where's my kid at? Is he, am I in the right organization? Am I in the right team? Am I at the right level? Because um, the, the, you, you make a lot of mistakes you learn from, but there should be a lot of successes in there if you're doing the right things too. Right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. No. And all the comments were kind of going around that same kind of with the conversation we just yeah, naturally exactly, yeah. had. It kind of went in that way. We have a very intelligent audience. <laughs> experienced audience. Yes, experienced. I must have talked to these people before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you fixed them all, buddy. <laughs> yeah. No, this was like really great. And yeah, like, thank awesome. you so much for joining yeah, us today. You, and um, I'm gonna, can I get a sure. few points? Yeah, Sorry, yeah. I always kind of spiel at the end here. <laughs> I yeah. always go through, but this is so much a part of what our culture is here at Bloodline, right? Like we always are talking about life skills and development and how they come together, not just to make you a better person, but a better player, bring you to the next level. We are recruiting currently for our summer teams, our online performance teams, and for coaches that want to learn how to incorporate more of this into their environment. We have our, you know, hockey mindset for coaches certification that'll be kicking off soon. And any guys, anyone that wants information on any of those programs, just shoot us a private message, comment, you know, hell yeah below or something like that. And we'll, we'll get what you want. Uh, we'll get that information to you. Um, but truly like coach Mitch and um, having you here today so that our parents and our audience can learn from, you know, we say it all the time, but just like your parents tell you stuff all the time and you don't listen to them after a while, you know, it's good to have you come in here and kind of, you know, you keep it real. And that's what we try to do here. Exactly. We, we want people to hear, we're not looking for fake. We're not looking for, you know, the canned response. We're looking for, this is how it really is. And you can take it or leave it. No one's holding a gun to your head and making you and your kid, you know, sign up for a team, but this is for, for better or for worse, however you want to look at it, this, this is what it is. And, um, you know, I think it's important these conversations happen so that parents, coaches, organizations, players, everybody kind of can hear and it's more open rather than it being all like hush hush behind behind doors. Exactly. Yeah, no, and I, I thank you for having me. I'm glad. I'm glad you guys invited me. Um, you know, at the end of the day, there's no shortcuts to anything, hockey or life, and you just got to keep going. And if there is, unless you hit Powerball last night, which I didn't. Um, the winner was <laughs> Wisconsin. So that's the only, uh, the only way. And it's a process. It's a process um, and enjoy it. Enjoy it. And it's hard work. I, I'm a big believer. Of, you know, there's nothing like setting your goals and accomplishing them. There's, you, there, you know, that's one of the most rewarding and fun things to me is, you know, hitting and achieving goals. It's just as much fun as hanging out with Vinny and Marissa, right? Well, uh, you guys get a nod on that, but there's nothing <laughs> more, there, there's, there's nothing more better than, than accomplishing goals and, I don't know the, the things that I wanted the most and, and done the most. And I'm sure for everyone on this call is it, it's not easy. And there's just a great sense of accomplishment to work, work towards something and get it because, 
you know, it, it, it's a process, you know, no matter whether you're trying to be the best player you can be, or you're trying to play in juniors, college, or an NHL. It's a process. It's hard. There's ups and downs, and you just got to, you got to stick with it and keep fighting through it. And, you know, put your, get yourself with someone that knows what they're talking about. Keep listening to, to Marissa, not so much Vinny. Um, but <laughs> but it, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Hopefully I said maybe one or two things um, that help, 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 help uh, you guys on, on the call. And if you have any questions, you know, let Vinny and Marissa know and they can, uh, they can relay them to me and I'll get back to them and they can get back to you. Yeah, but give Coach Mitch so let's hit some love, some likes, a couple of shares. You know, it's not yeah. often he's here in social media world. It's no. usually uh, when Vinny dragged me in. So, uh, <laughs> you know, be sure to share it out. This is like a like a animal sighting in the, in the safari, right? Like here is Coach Mitch live. So share it out. He exists. He's real. <laughs> Just not somewhere. a name on the website. Just not another pretty face. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but thank you all for tuning in today. Thank you guys. Marathon man. today, but it was awesome. Was and uh, as always, everyone have a great week. Thank you to Coach Mitch. And I uh, will see you next week. Yep. All right. Exactly. Thank you. Bye. Yes.